All right. We'll copy live. Ah! All right. So we're going to do. Um, we're doing uh, healthcare.gov. Then we're doing Detroit. Then we're doing uh, minimum wage. We have Chatter, and that's about it. Do you um, have minimum wage in the third position because it's less interesting, or I just because they kind of one could you because the president talked about? Yeah, shouldn't it Detroit be last? Like, okay, let me just let me just adjust my script because I got but don't I don't think it's crucial, so don't mess with your script if it's you know what I'm saying like. No, I think you you guys are right. I just it was uh, let me just quickly give me two seconds. How was your Thanksgiving, Emily? It seems so long ago. It was good. How was yours? I got less antsy than usual at okay. my in-laws. Uh, mine was, in mine was good. We had Give me one second. Give me one second. Oh, my Give God. How did people do it doing the dishes? <laughs> was it the usual? We're, we're live, aren't we? Uh, well, you know, actually, uh, on the dishwashing project, I'm almost the, ready. the dishwasher collapsed, like, the day before. So uh, Bryce and I got on YouTube, found a video took the dishwasher apart and fixed it um, and then had to fix it again. But anyway, uh, as you know from the previous saga, that okay. having a working dishwasher is a very important part yeah, of the I'm day. Getting, uh, yeah. John, really. Even all, after all that talking, Emily, you know, I mean, you're actually not, like, not. You're, you're, we've lost your chin again, Emily, just FYI. Like it's curious what's tonight. happening. That's what you need for my chin to be there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I have to stand up straighter. So what if I do that? Are you guys hearing no, John in your headphones? Yeah. Um, okay. Should I keep talking? No, no. Jeff says I'm hearing John. What's that? Uh, Jeff says you guys should start the show. Yeah, we, we can't because we don't have audio. Hello, everybody. Oh, you know, I just yawned. So that's the third yawn of the... You'd already yawned. That's your second Had yawn. I? Yes. Oh, my God. I keep losing track of my yawns. It's the first sign. Of... So if I push this down, would that... Provide more of my chin. Hmm. Uh, I'm talking. We're on right. now, Emily. So yeah. whatever you're doing. You're whatever I'm doing is live. Okay. Yeah. Do it live. I'm going to keep talking in the event that this. So. There's, there's a hand up back here. Me. Yeah. Just squeeze it. Um, uh, how was your better? Thanksgiving, 19 pies? Great. It was great. That's yeah. best. You've got it. Good. Oh, you've got it. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. That's All right. The, there we great. go. Do you have John yet? Uh, should I keep talking? Uh, you know what? I don't hear. Wait, do I hear John? Um, I don't know. I'm gonna keep talking. Um, yeah, I do not have John. I don't have John. I don't. Oh, have I, have either have any of you guys dealt with concussions in your children? No, but you, you Bryce got one. They take. He got a mild concussion two days ago, and man, did they take it seriously? Like, what was it? He's from? out. He ran into another kid. Mm. During basketball, um, uh, took him to. The, I mean, first of all, wait. Emily hears him. The funny thing is, yeah, we're good. We, we I do. Him. Oh, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Good. Anyway, I three him. days of cognitive rest and a month of no sports. Wow. Yeah. Okay. We ready? Yep. And, uh, yeah. That was all broadcast the world, by the way. Uh, well, <laughs> if there's a doctor out there who can uh, uh, tell me what. Um, the other than obvious results would be from getting at least three, maybe four concussions and doing nothing about it in high school. Send me an email. That's, that's Dickerson. <laughs> yeah. that's what we I mean, when I got concussions, you know, they say the first 48 hours is the important period. You know, you don't want to, like, jostle the brain again. In football, I just went back into the game. Like, yeah. and then never stopped going to school, never rested or anything. So I'm hearing uh, feedback. This, you're not even speaking English now. Hey, Mike, exactly. I'm hearing feedback. Slapback, Mike. Slapback. We used to play slapback slap during uh, during recess. Is their audio coming back to you. The Mike uh, Rick says it's your audio coming back to me. Ooh. Huh. Is it but not through the iPad, I don't think. Headsets. No. Should we keep talking in order to test yes. that? We are keeping talking. Uh, anyway, so that's been the newest excitement in the particular I mean, I can live with what it. I just don't know. What about now? What about now? You got what about now? now? What you got slap now? back? You got, slap you got back? some slap back? You got some baby back slap back? I like What about some slap and slap? Tickle? What? Emily, are you still getting slap back? It's now I just, uh, can you just keep talking? It's on this machine. Oh, it is, is the it's... iPad. Yeah. Okay. Turn the volume all the way down. Oh, all right. man. Come on. Come on, back. Emily. That's so weird. Emily? Yeah, we're now, discovering now that the we iPad can hear. doesn't now we can hear it. completely, it seems. 
Huh? <laughs> Come on. Really? That's not. Wait. Wait. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is. Oh huh. yeah, coming back. Mike, yeah. is it okay? Google Hangout. No. You're getting all of the. You're getting this real behind the scenes. This like. is how the shows normally work. No, it's from the uh, iPad. Yeah. Definitely. You can't turn the volume off on the timer. That's crazy that, that you can't mute it. How could that be? Of course you can um, mute it, Emily. We can mute it. Oh, yeah. hang on a second. She has a special iPad you can't mute. Don't say a damn thing. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be just fine. Excuse me. Where the hell is the Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. So then the monkey said to me. That's right. And then I found $5. Okay. I think we fixed it. All right. How about now? Slap him yeah, back? Now I, but I need more of you now. Mike, can we turn okay. the back up? Yeah, I'll turn the back up. All right. Here we go. We're, now we're talking. Oh. We're talking here. Of Christmas. We're good? Geniusly fix that problem. All right, John, good. make sure she can hear you. Uh, Emily, can you hear me? Or do you, do you want to hear that story about my dishwasher again? You know what's interesting about dishwashers? How much oh, broken glass gets stuck in the bottom. That's right, true. That's A good lot point. of broken glass. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. You've stumbled onto something new, which is a Slate experiment. You are watching a live stream of our regular taping of the Slate Political Gap Fest. It's something we might try more often in the future. Please bear with us if we run into any technical hip hiccups today. <laughs> that was in the script. Yeah. I can't imagine what kind of technical we run, hiccups yeah. we could run into. But please definitely bear with happen. us if we actually get the show going. During the show, you can comment and leave questions in the live chat on this page. At the end of the show, our producers will select, select two or three of the most popular questions, and we will answer them. If you have any feedback about today's live stream, there's a survey link on this page. The, pub, the podcast will publish tomorrow as usual. Thank you for watching. And what, now, what if you on have with the back? show. What if you have slapback? If you have slapback, slap go back, see your doctor it immediately. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest for December 5th, 2013, the Motor City Massacre edition. I'm David Flotsy, editor of Slate. Just a week out from our two-night, two-show San Francisco tour. We are very excited for it. We're going to have special guests. We're going to have cocktails. There will be a conundrum show. In fact, anyone who is coming to our December 10th show, come with a conundrum. We're going to have some live conundrum solving on that show on December 10th at Rickshaw Stop. With me today, Slate DC companion as ever, John Dickerson, Slate's chief political correspondent. You had a great headline in your piece today, John, which was the Obama selling of the Affordable Care Act has reached its sham wow phase. Was that your line? No, that wasn't my, no, that wasn't my line. I, yeah, no, I don't know who it was that was. It was a great line. It sounded like a Dickerson line. Yeah, no, well, no. I, yeah, no, we can talk about that. All right. Then, via the miracle of electronic communication from New Haven, is Slate senior editor Emily Baslin. Hello, Emily. Hello. This week's Political Gab Fest, we will talk about healthcare.gov. The president says it's now working well enough. Is 95.1% uptime adequate? I don't know. Maybe. Yet another weird lawsuit threatens to cripple Obamacare, also from Oklahoma, but this time it's not Hobby Lobby and it's not about contraception. Then there is a fast food strike to raise the minimum wage from $7.25 to $15. Does this movement for a living wage have a chance? And then we'll talk about Detroit, once America's fourth largest city, is careened into bankruptcy. Is its collapse an anomaly? Does it herald a dark vision for the future of American cities generally. And of course, we will have cocktail chatter. The slow-moving disaster that is the implementation of Obamacare had two new twists this week. First, the administration announced that it had more or less met its goal of having healthcare.gov substantively working by November 30th. We're going to talk about what that means. Second, a judge in DC ruled that plaintiffs have standing to sue and a challenge to yet another key provision of Obamacare. This suit claims that under the law, the federal government cannot give subsidies or issue penalties to anyone who signs up for Obamacare through the federal exchanges. They can only do it for the uh, minority of states that have their own state exchanges, so that the subsidies that make insurance affordable for many, many people won't be available to people through the federal exchanges under this theory. If this is successful, this lawsuit would I think we could probably safely say would utterly gut the, the, 
Affordable Care Act. So we're going to talk about whether it has a chance and where it's going. So John, the uh, Obama administration claims that uptime is at 95% on healthcare.gov, that page loads are at one second and that more and more people are able to complete the whole process of signing up for insurance. Any decent website has an uptime of a way over 99%. So, and, and the fact that the majority of people, or maybe even 80% of people, let's say, in the best case, are able to complete the process of signing up for insurance through, through the healthcare.gov website somehow doesn't hearten me. Right. But should I be heartened? Well, no, I think another, uh, you know, I don't, well, you should be heartened in that it's better than it was when it was in a state of total collapse. But then from there, we have to figure out. I mean, one of the things about these numbers, you, you understand those numbers and put them in context, but it's also true. It's like if they said, you know, the Thrappernator is operating at maximum efficiency for put time at the juncture six. <laughs> right? And you'd be like, wow, wow great! The that's Thrappernator. Awesome! So the problem here is that, like, they're, they're saying, we've made 600 bug fixes. Well, okay, great, but compared to what and, comp and how valuable are those fixes and so on and so on. So we basically have to take them at their word that they've got the thing up and running. And as we saw from a very good um, TikTok of the disaster from October 1st to December 1st and how it was handled, throughout it, the administration was in uh, sort of two different postures with respect to information it was giving to the public. It was either actively uh, misleading the public or it was misleading the public because it didn't know what was actually going on with the site itself. So we don't know whether it's snapped out of those two postures and whether what it's telling us is true or not. What we can say is that lots more people appear to be signing up, not just because the administration says so, but because there are a lot more sort of stories of people being able to get through and it being smooth, and there are fewer stories of people ha having lots and lots of difficulties. Um, so it does look like... Uh, and, and I should say the third thing is that the administration is putting on this big sell to get people to sign up, and they would be insane to do that if the website weren't working at, at some level. But they are in some ways a little bit insane because while the website is working, the so-called back end, the, where the insurance companies get the information, is still not working very well. And in fact, they delayed the fix of, of that portion of the, pro of the system while they were fixing the website itself. So what's happening is insurance companies are getting some faulty information, they're not getting some information in some cases, and if that's the case, then you can think you've signed up, but then you haven't signed up, and that could create a huge problem, which they've now exacerbated by sending all co new kinds of applicants there. And so for them to say that it's kind of up and running um, is only a part of the story. Yes, so Emily, I think it was a Washington Post story suggested that as many as a third, is that right? A third of the people who have signed up for insurance through the Affordable Care Act uh, may not have may not have signed up for the thing that they expect, they, that it may not have processed correctly. <laughs> They're getting a new blender. Incredibly alarming. And at the, also, we learned that the number of young people signing up for Obamacare seems to be very low. The administration wanted it to be at least 35% uh, young people in the pool of, of getting people getting insurance. It appears to be way less than that, maybe as, as less than a quarter of the people getting insurance are the young people that that the administration says it needs. So what is the administration to do with all of this? Is there is there a way to salvage it that you see? I think they can do the best campaign they can, but this is the it seems like this is a solvable problem, right? This was about the website malfunctioning. Once it's up and running, if this is a good program it will sell. But it's damaged in terms of people's perceptions of whether it's a success or not. And so the idea that you're going to be excited to be part of this new toy that the government is wheeling out, I think that's all gone. And that might be particularly damaging for young people in terms of signing up. I also feel, though, that every time we talk about this, the notion that it's going to fail, we make it more likely that it's going to fail because it just seems less and less of like an appealing, attractive program. And it depends on. But market that's not share, our so wait. But Emily, that's there, there was claims. In fact, the there saying. were some progressives saying this week, "Oh, the liberal journalists, you should not talk about how bad no, everything I'm is." I'm not saying that's we shouldn't talk bull. about it. Of course, you should. Just, just make an observation. I, I I agree with both yeah. of you. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, the camera, the camera caught that. Job. Yeah, right. I bet. I just think that the perception of it as failing contributes to it failing because it's a right. product, and like all products, when you're selling it in the marketplace, if it starts to seem like, you know, a, a lemon, then nobody wants a part of it. Matt Iglesias made the case in Slate this week that this failure has really damaged the progressive cause for the future. That that people are going to be incredibly skeptical about the idea that government it really is a solution, federal government in particular, it really is a solution. It's going to be a very hard sell uh, for anybody because this has been such a high-profile fiasco. Do you, do you see anything to that, John? Well, I think, it, I think the next big hill that somebody wants to climb using... Well, well, okay, so one of the problems here is that for the majority, as we've talked about a million times before, for the people who have health insurance, their fear is that this big government program was going to mess up their health insurance. And so you have a huge people with a political interest to be against this if they're worried that it's going to screw up their insurance. So um, in a sense, you had people kind of girding against this government program from the start. You could imagine in the future, if they wanted a government program, uh, if it was reversed and most of the people wanted the government program, they'd be fine with it, you know, because they want the, the promised product in the end. So I think... Uh, to that extent, somebody promising big government action to solve a problem isn't necessarily damaged. It just sort of depends on whether people want that solution. But it, if people don't want the solution and you're trying to bring them along to it and convince them it's the right thing to do, then this does make it that much harder because they think, here, the government couldn't do this thing. It had several years to do. Uh, it wasn't a surprise. And they you know, screwed it up royally. What do you think, Emily? Are you, do you I believe the Iglesias argument? Right, that it's neither the absolute calamity forever, but that it, yeah, it's going to make it harder for us to believe in this kind of a mechanism for solving problems. And also there's a lot of distrust in the government, period, that for, for a variety of other reasons as well. And so this, um, you know, if this had happened in the middle of a period where everybody was happy with the, the operations of government, it would have been not as bad, but this builds on to and compounds an existing distrust of government and institution, big institutions. It's funny, It's I, this just occurred to me, and I'm sure this is a terrible analogy and it's going to fall apart, but I wonder if this is going to have the same, a similar kind of effect that the Vietnam War and the, Pentag the Pentagon Papers did, is that all of a sudden you, ha you have this, these government bureaucrats government leaders who, who claim to be so smart, who claim to be so capable, so on top of it, to have a strategy, and then suddenly the curtain is pulled back on, on the Vietnam War and you realize it's all a sham. And the Obama administration... The best and the brightest metaphor comes yeah, from that. Yeah, the best you. and the brightest comes from that, exactly. <laughs> but that this is a similar thing, which is that, that so many people, and I count myself one of the suckers among them, thought, well, the Obama is a very smart, analytical guy. He's, you know, he clearly is capable of using technology very effectively, at least as a political campaigner. Of course they're, this is going to be taken care of. And the fact that they botched it so badly makes you think that, it, that really, that, that no institution can be trusted, that government really can't do the job. And if, it's, if, it, if I'm affected that way, uh, if, that, if that's causing the kind of cynicism in me that I suspect that the, the, the Vietnam caused on a lot of people 40 years ago, then... I, I suspect it's a, a more widespread feeling. This is yeah, why I've about... never had these feelings about government health care before, exactly, have we? I mean, we don't feel this way about Medicare. Or even, I mean, Medicaid is more flawed and has problems with doctors taking, uh, taking the payments and whether the rates are high enough. But we basically think of these social safety nets as successful in terms of what they provide. And yet this time, because of healthcare.gov and the role of the government set, playing in setting up the exchanges, we're kind of forced to confront the pitfalls of this bureaucracy, right? Well, maybe, or, and this is why, I, you know, I, I think the MacArthur Foundation should give a huge grant to somebody to go figure out where this messed up and in what specific ways, because I think as a person who believes in active government, you could make the case and you'd want, you know, you could investigate to see if this was borne out, but that it's not the bureaucrats who screwed up here. Um, that the bureaucrats uh, or the government workers did the best they could it, under the constraints that the political operation inside the administration added and then the political constraints put on it by Republicans both in the Congress who wouldn't fund it but then also in the governors and the states who resisted it so that you have and but 
so that you have the bureaucrats might have had they been given a clean shot at this, they might have been able to put something together. Who knows? Right. Maybe that's Medicare, crazy. If you'd expanded Medicare to include everyone, you probably yeah. could have done it right easily. And and but I think also there was just there was such a a crouch in the administration that that they didn't want to do anything that would hurt the president's election chances. They didn't want to do anything that would give the Republicans a target, and that they kept pinching themselves into weirder contortions in order to avoid those bad political outcomes and that that then constrained the operational requirements in such a way well, that it made it right and the impossible. and the initial law even if there had they hadn't had to constrain themselves the initial law is was such a a Frankenstein monster of a law that it was under any circumstances even if there had been an agreeable congress and a president with total dictatorial powers it still would have been pretty ugly in implementation just because well, it's, it's a the mess of a law. exchanges are working, or at least some of them are working well. So, I mean, are you sure that the monstrosity right. of the law? The no, no, well, the, different constraints? well, what do you mean? Well, the depends. state exchanges? No, no, well, the state exchanges make the argument that the politicians in Washington, that the politicians inside the administration screwed it up. That the state exchanges, I mean, the state exchanges are not as complicated as the federal exchange, so it's not an exact um, measure. But, um, you know, in the states where they were less freaked out about Republicans coming after them, um, perhaps they were able to, you know, operationally work it through better. I don't know. But, but that, go ahead. No, you finish your thought. Uh, no, that, that was, uh, I mean, the, the beauty of the state exchanges goes back to one of your earlier points, David, I think you raised this. But, um, I mean, the, the, the fact is, in the state exchanges where it's working and people can actually operate the website, the, the traffic and the desire has been pretty high, which is still something the Obama administration can cling to as a, as a really wonderful promised land they can get to, which is if they get the federal system operating, that there, there are lots and lots of people who want to sign up, and that might bring this thing back to health. Let's pivot, actually, speaking of the state exchanges, to this very interesting, disheartening lawsuit that's been brought by the Attorney General of Oklahoma, somebody named uh, something Pruitt, I forgot his first name, and he is making a legal argument that is pretty profound. Emily, can you outline it? He is making the argument that Obamacare, just you look at the text of the law, that it authorizes subsidies for people getting health care only if they get it through the state exchanges, not if they get it through the federal exchanges. And this is looms much larger than it would have otherwise because there are so many states that have refused to set up their own exchanges. And he has text of statute to cite. If you look, if you zero in on the particular clause in this huge, huge law that talks about setting up the state exchanges, it refers to a, a number in the law, section 1311, that's about the state exchanges, not about a federal one. So the question is whether that clear reading of that line of the statute trumps lots of other places in the law in which it's clear that Congress was contemplating the federal government having a greater role in these exchanges. And I don't think it's a slam dunk for the federal government at all. Oh, really? Why? Wait. The kid, let's... Why? Let's talk. Can we talk about first the implications, and then get get, get to the where, where this case is going? The implications, just if this is if this lawsuit succeeded, there would it would be illegal for the federal government to give subsidies to people who are getting their insurance through the federal exchanges. As a result, their insur the insurance costs for those people would be much 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 higher. They right. wouldn't sign up. It wouldn't be worth it. And also, they couldn't be penalized. There's another thing, which is the, the people who are signing up through the federal exchanges could not be penalized. Therefore, the IRS couldn't couldn't punish them for not getting insurance. Right. The, law would, the, the, the law would collapse. The law would collapse. The subsidies and the penalties are they the are thing the that, that push people yeah. into line to sign up. Without that, they don't sign up. Okay, so why is this a strong case, and what was the legal action that occurred this week? Well, the, the judge, who the federal district court judge who's overseeing this case refused to just throw it out of court on what's called a motion to dismiss. That means it passed a low bar, but the first bar to actually being developed as a case on the merits. You know, the reason I think this isn't a slam dunk for the federal government is the rules of statutory interpretation. I mean, this is going to get into the weeds really quickly, and I didn't take the class called legislation in law school because essentially my eyes it. glaze over whenever I try to read a statute. What? You didn't even take it. 
I didn't so you're like a fake. You're gonna like fake you, your way through it. You go ahead. At least you go ahead. At least you didn't take it and then not go. Basically, the statue interpretation is like give a lot of honor <laughs> to the actual words of the statue and to the plain meaning of the statue. To the statue. Yeah, especially yes. Or the statue. Yeah. Also, the, actually, the statue. that would be like a cool the statue. Class. You, have to, you have to abide by what is writ whatever is written on the statue. Give me your oh, time. Yes, and you act so glibly, but in fact, it is really hard to read a lot of statutes, and there's a whole. Bunch no, you didn't. Of you didn't get the reference. We were just. Hold on. I refer to. There, I was I was referring to statues. Oh, statues. Instead of statues. <laughs> That's the joke. That statues was like, okay. made of matchsticks. Anyway, into one another. No, it was, uh, I was not. I probably would have taken that course. I guess it's actually maybe not. All right. I know. Can I go back to statutory judge, John. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Interpretation. You know, there's a, a pretty persuasive body of scholarship that's arguing that Congress is increasingly writing unclear laws and just kind of throwing up its hands and asking the agencies to figure this out afterward as because they can't come to agreement. That probably wasn't what was going on with Obamacare. I mean, we're talking about this gargantuan law that had tons of text in it. And it's entirely possible that this particular line was just like a bad oversight and just poorly written. Or maybe as the people bringing this case from the Cato Institute and Jonathan Adler, who's the law professor behind it, Maybe they're making an argument that no, this was about Congress trying to promote the state exchanges and prevent the federal government, or at least like give it a less of a role here. I don't think there's really any evidence for that. But this is the problem with with um, not so. If you were just taking this part of the law, then I think this lawsuit would succeed. And the problem is, okay, when do you read statutes in a way where you just zero in on the plain reading of one line of text? And when do you read them in such a way where you take into account the intent of the entire law and you pull other pieces in from other places in this giant statute and then try to interpret everything together? And there basically are different rules of statutory construction and the challengers are trying to argue plain meaning in this very strict way. And the Obama administration is defending the law by saying, no, no, you wanna make sure you read it as a whole so that no part becomes absurd or just doesn't fit. And, and that's the debate. So as a, as a court handicapper, Emily, would it be your guess that if this ends up at the Supreme Court, that this is something the Roberts court would welcome I mean they had they already went through such drama over de determining this law was constitutional at least the basically was constitutional are they will it really going to be willing to go back to it and it, is John Roberts going to be willing to go back to it and say you know what I held it was constitutional but now I'm just gonna gut the thing on these different grounds I can't imagine John Roberts wants to revisit this I mean don't you think he's like still recovering from his hangover from the last time I and it just seems like they would love to stay as far away from this as they possibly can. But if these challenges are brought all over the country, it only takes one federal appeals court to say, hey, we think these challenges are right, and, and then other ones to disagree. And then there's a circuit split over one of the most important federal laws. I think they'll kind of be forced to take it. I mean, this is down the line. And maybe I'm wrong, and all of these cases will get thrown out in federal district court. But, you know, this comes back to the composition of the court. It only takes a few conservative judges who have it in for Obamacare to get these cases moving. Frankly, this case seems a lot more... Uh, based on a solid foundation, the uh, last Obamacare case does no, to me as a non-lawyer. Opposed to constitutional, so yeah, right. you're right about that. It's very concrete. It's what was Congress intending when it wrote this thing, and it looks like it was saying, "Hey, only state exchanges get these subsidies." But if it was saying two things, if the law is, does the tie go to the runner? I mean, in other words, if the if you can cite two different pieces of the legislation that are sort of at war with each other, isn't the clear intention that people can't you then sort of? I mean, how do you how do you adjudicate that? Do you look at what the clear intention was of the people promoting the law? Because the clear intention of the people who passed it was to have these subsidies available, whether it's through a federal exchange or a state exchange. So that's a great question, and the answer is different justices see it differently. When you're talking about the intent of the legislators, you're talking about legislative history. You go back, you look at the committee reports. What did people testify to? What what did the previous draft say? There are justices on the Supreme Court, most of them the liberal moderates, who are happy to look at all of that. And then there is Justice Scalia, who thinks it is absolutely wrong to look at legislative history. You only look at the last version of the text. You do not care about the steps going up to it. And that's a big unresolved debate. There is no one single answer to it.
Okay. I just banged that microphone. All right. Because you wanted me to be quiet. I was wanted us to wrap like up. To do anything I want. Together I wanted to us to wrap up. Let's let's uh, hear from our first sponsor this week, which is Stamps.com. With the holidays almost here, you don't have time to go to the post office. There's traffic, there's parking. It's going to be packed with everyone mailing their holiday gifts and packages. So use Stamps.com instead. With Stamps.com, you can avoid all the hassle of going to the post office during the busy holiday season. Everything you do at the post office, you can do right in your desk. You can buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer. You can print postage for any letter or package the instant you need it, and the mailman will pick it up. And it's easy and convenient. So right now, you get this special offer when you use our promo code GABFEST, a no-risk trial, and a $110 bonus offer which includes a digital scale, useful for weighing your presence, too, and up to $55 in free postage. For all the details of the special offer and to sign up today, go to stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in GABFEST. That's stamps.com. Enter GABFEST. You want to say something? I just want to ask Emily, could the court kick it back to Congress like it did with the Voting Rights Act? Could yeah, the court sure, say, you guys really messed up the language, it was a comp... Yeah, because then... Absolutely. Because then you imagine the court could kick it back, and then it could becomes. I mean, so the Senate, you know, then the control of the Senate really matters. Well, I mean, but no, it would have to pass as a bill. Well, but unfixed, I mean, they expect Congress to unfixed? fix it with the Voting Rights Act. Unfixed. Oh, They'll never boy. fix it. There's no but way. But does that mean? But but then but then it then what interpretation stands? If they wouldn't then fix it, it. Then if the court says, we can't tell what this says. It depends what the court says. What the court that's could say happen. is, look, it looks that's to us like happen. plain language. Yeah. Like what? Now you're no, I'm saying that John's, that that's what's going to happen, isn't it? They're yeah, going to do that. and then it is like the Voting Rights Act thing. It's like, okay, Congress, you guys figure it out, and if you can't get together, too bad. We're sorry. It's a much safer stance. But we're, we're, so sorry. we're sorry. We're so, does we're sorry mean the law is, stays in effect? The, the federal government can do what it wants. Well, the because the federal says, government, because the Obama administration has made an, a ruling, an executive ruling, that it means this. Would that be the default decision, or would the default, would they in fact say no, it's it's something else? They could do it either way. But it, what, if you imagine the conservative sneak attack on the law and John Roberts signing on to it, what it looks like is another run of the Voting Rights Act decision where in this case, the court would say, well, it looks like you messed up this line of the statute and you didn't allow the federal exchanges to play this role. And if you guys want to fix that, if we're getting your intention wrong, go ahead, pass a new law. All right. Love that. Great coda there, John. Thanks for asking that. A pro-labor coalition mostly led by the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, organized a one-day strike at fast food restaurants in 100 cities on Thursday. At the time we're taping, it is not clear how successful the strike was or is, but it's certainly drawn attention to the movement to raise the federal minimum wage for fast food workers and other workers from $7.25 to $15. This is a wildly ambitious number. Uh, Washington, D.C., for example, a very liberal place, has just pushed the wage here from $8.25 <laughs> to eleven fifty, or the city council has passed that. It's not in effect yet. So $15 would be incredibly high. Um, the supporters of a federal minimum wage hike note that the effective federal minimum wage has dropped by $3 an hour in the past generation. And it should be at least $10 to, to keep pace with what it was. Opponents of hiking the federal minimum wage, or any minimum wage, say it restricts businesses from innovating, raises unemployment, it makes it uh, raises prices, and generally acts as a drag on the economy. So, John, President Obama gave a speech this week. He, he uh, talked about the minimum wage a little bit. What is it that he's, what position is he trying to stake out here? Well, he, has, he wants the minimum wage just to raise to $10, so he's not going all the way. Um, the president... This week, it's very interesting, both from a policy standpoint and also politically, but he basically um, said, this is what the focus of my administration will be for the remaining three years. And that is essentially what he, his, the focus has been since he's been running for the presidency, which is to try to restore the bargain at the heart of the American experience, which is that if you work hard and play by the rules, you'll have a chance. And so he's tackling the two big issues of income inequality and the lack of social mobility. Um, the fact that, you know, and we can cite all kinds of different uh, statistics that incomes essentially have, been, have flatlined since 
depending on you, how you measure it, since the 80s, or that since the recovery, 95% of the gains since 2007 have gone to the top 1%. You know, we, there are millions of little of statistics you can put forward. And his argument is we need to correct this um, balance, and the, the minimum wage is at the heart of that. I, I argued that... Um, He's not going to get anywhere with the minimum wage in the same way he got. He had trouble. I mean, he mentioned this in his State of the Union. He's mentioned a series of these programs. Early childhood education is another one. Investment for different kinds of worker training. Uh, the college loan. I mean, uh, the college costs. Bringing them down is another part of this effort to reorganize um, the winners and losers in the current state of the economy. That be actually the best thing he can do for inequality is is make sure his health care plan survives because for the two-thirds of the people who are signing up who had no kind of insurance at all ever, um, this is the best thing you can do for them to uh, ameliorate the effects of being on the losing side of, of an economy that's been tilted. So because the law is passed and as tricky and troublesome as it's been, he can actually do something as opposed to with some of these other measures where he's basically going to be stymied by right. the House Republicans. Right. So, so Emily, all signs are that there is no chance the Congress as currently constituted would raise the federal minimum wage. Um, right. Right. And, right. And yet, I didn't, I mean, hearing about how low it is compared to what it was in the 1960s made my heart drop because you just think of the notion that you would be working full time and still be under the poverty line for yourself and your children, there should be something dismaying about that, shouldn't there? Yeah, I mean, I, I find there was a great John Cassidy article in The New Yorker about this, about the, the minimum wage case, and it's very interesting. So, so the basic case against raising the federal minimum wage is that it raises unemployment, that it reduces corporate independence, that it, and that it mainly helps teenagers. Uh, and that it raises prices. There basically isn't any evidence for certainly the first three of those. That if you look at unemployment rates in states with higher minimum wages, they, there's no connection, there's no apparent connection between employment and, and minimum wage. There are places with high minimum wage with lower unemployment, places with low minimum wage with high unemployment. It, 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 the labor market fluctuations appear to have very little to do with minimum wage. Um, and it, it is true that this constrains corporations that have to then pay higher wages to their employees. On the other hand, there are lots of ways in which government has constrained employees by making them do things, you know, providing bathroom breaks or not, you know, not requiring employees to work uh, in, in hazardous conditions. There, there are things that the federal government is constantly doing. And there, there's a movement on the right which says, no, 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 corporations should, should not be constrained in this way. Uh, they should be free to innovate and do what they want, and we should we should get rid of these restrictions. And if workers don't like it, they're free to vote with their feet, not work there, and go work elsewhere at a place which has different working conditions. And that just doesn't take into account the fact that really, if you're poor, if you're living in a lot of places in this country with limited access to employment, limited access to transportation, limited education, you just you have very little uh, you have very little. Um, SWAT as a worker to do anything. The workers, the power of workers relative to employers has never been lower than it is now. And the only countervailing force about that right now is government because unions have been so gutted. Uh, so the government is the only countervailing force and, and government has the power to raise the minimum wage, but it, it just simply won't do it because there's such a strong position on the right against it. Another argument against <clears throat> raising it, though, which uh, was intriguing to me, is that um, in CBO, the last time that we had this debate, I think it was the last time anyway, did a, an analysis of if you raise the minimum wage to $7.25, um, that would increase wages by $11 billion, $1.6 billion of which went to the poor. So this goes back, I guess, to your teenagers and burger flipping idea. By contrast, if you if you um, increase the earned income tax credit, which goes directly uh, to large families that are poor, uh, for it would cost about 2.4 billion, of which 1.4 billion would go to the poor. So you get greater bang for your buck through things like EITC than you do through minimum wage. If your if your goal is to get get at the poor and and, and well, both of both. both of those things can be true. You can you can you can say. EITC is a is a worthwhile project to right. expand, but I guess and also the, think that minimum in the wage political triage that will happen, right? So what will happen is that this pressure on inequality is going to continue to grow, 
and it's going to continue to, Republicans are going to have to come up with some kind of argument against it because one of the problems they have at the federal level is not just the demographic challenges, but the fact that they lack kind of a middle class agenda. And so there's been some searching in the Republican um, ranks to try and come up with something that would that would stand in for that. So you're going to have a moment, an inequality moment, and there will be some kind of legislation. To the extent that you get only so many whacks at the inequality, you want to make them the right. most efficient ones possible. And so the question is, if you raise the minimum wage, do you create a situation in which people say, okay, well, we took care of the inequality thing, and now we won't, we don't do this, we won't do this more effective measure? I don't know, but right. it just seemed like it is a more... The other way to argue it is there's no chance that you get an expansion of the earned income tax credit and so better the minimum wage than nothing. Although I'm not sure that I agree that one is less or more. They both seem so politically out of reach right now. It's hard to say like, oh, the minimum wage is plausible. I, I also, right. And, and one, there's a psychological benefit that you get from getting higher wages. I mean, I have employed people. Right. And when you give somebody a raise, people are happier having a raise right. than knowing that at the end of the year, the government, which is a form of uncertainty for people, and people don't understand their taxes in the best of circumstances, right. like the idea that, oh, yes, this magical refund will be slightly higher. It's not the same as saying you're going to have $3 extra an hour. Um, also, the fact is that we have a much lower minimum wage than, than counterpart economies. If you look at European economies, minimum wages are significantly higher than ours. Now, you know, they have higher unemployment rates, but even in a relatively flexible place like the UK, there's a there's a minimum wage that's higher. Um, and I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, that's a good point. It's a, it's a fair point, John. Like well, I don't know. A bit efficient, maybe you aspire for efficiency. I. Well, I just think that if you... I, I, you know, you're not going to get a, a huge omnibus bill, and so you want to pick their smartest shots. And that seems to be uh, an argument that is slightly different also than the traditional ones with the minimum wage, right? Because we feel like... And also, actually, I have one other point, which is that... In, sorry, I just thought of this. Okay. Which is insofar as this is a, this is a national movement by a, in a, a public, uh, by a union, private sector union, to do this. They know there's no chance that this can happen at the federal level. They, they are aware of that. They're not stupid people. What this is is an attempt to put pressure on individual states, I suspect, to make there be a state action, to make people at the state level realize, oh, there's inequality, and to get places like as Washington, D.C. did. Washington, D.C. just you know, significantly upped its minimum wage. And, and to make the case that having a higher minimum wage, as 19 states do, is something that can be economically beneficial for you. And is that actually maybe a better... And, it, and you can't do that with earned income tax credits. Right. 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 But we do have tremendous <laughs> regional variation in terms of the cost of living. And so for that reason, could you argue that actually the state-by-state -state solution in this case is particularly pref preferable and just a good idea to try? Maybe, yeah. I want to... One other thing just about the politics of the inequality agenda. I mean, clearly it is a issue that needs to be dealt with. Um, but when you look at the president and where, you know, it, it, his approval ratings are low, people are talking about him already as a lame duck. The number of people who were talking about the fact that he's going to stay in town after he's out of office so that his daughter can continue her high school, it was like, they. I mean, that's three years from now, and yet people were sort of already kind of talking about it like he was on the cusp of the threshold to leave. One of the powers he still has is the kind of convening conversation power, which is he can get everybody talking about something. And to the extent that he did that this week with this speech about inequality, it helps Democrats who can, you know, this is a topic they can sink their teeth into. Yeah, but I don't think he had anything to do with it. I don't think his speech well, had don't... anything to do with it. I think it's these the fast food strikes or well, what's getting people talking about it. Well, that's that's probably true. And there's no question that the president, I mean, and that people have been talking, I mean, the, uh, the Occupy movement was about, you know, obviously uh, about income inequality. So yeah, he didn't discover it. But but I think that to the extent that his conversation has been about a, a website and his health care plan, that if you move, if he can move the Washington conversation to inequality, it's a much better space for Democrats, a better, better thing for Democrats to be talking about than why, they're, why the health care program isn't working. And since the health care program is a part of this inequality, it just kind of gets everybody onto a familiar song sheet that they know and that they can feel strong about, and that turns out their voters in a non-presidential election year when you want to do that. So though this has merit, there's also a lot of political benefit too. Okay. Podcast is also 
brought to you this week by the University of California. For almost 150 years, the UC system has been a beacon of innovation, making the future bold and pushing the boundaries of today's health and science. Today's breakthrough, what if we could bottle happiness or at least learn how to maintain it at consistently high levels? Professor Sonia Lubomirsky introduces happiness intervention strategies that offer real-world techniques for boosting and prolonging fe feelings of contentment and joy. To read the story and uncover more groundbreaking innovations by the University of California, visit slate.com slash breakthroughs. The city of Detroit is bankrupt. A bankruptcy judge this week declared that it declared it so, and he also said that in the bankrupt bankruptcy proceedings, the city could conceivably cut pensions that have been guaranteed to retired workers in order to pay off its debts and to get city services back on an even keel. The city could also conceivably sell its art collection to pay off some of its many billions in municipal debt. The pension decision is seen as enormous because, in this case, federal bank bankruptcy law is trumping Michigan state law, or Michigan constitutional law, guaranteeing the pensions, which uh, is a kind of amazing thing that happened. The, this is a ruined city. Its population is a third of what it once was. It's now essentially under the control of a state receiver appointed by the governor. Um, Emily, is, is what's happening to Detroit anomalous, or is this a future for, or for many American cities? Does this await well, many American it's cities? it's not anomalous, because there are other smaller cities around the country that have also tried to go bankrupt. I guess I think what's unique to Detroit, or that's always the wrong word to use, but what's pretty rare is a city that's just become an utter and total shell of its former self, and has been emptied of any kind of economic vitality. That is not something I feel like we're seeing in other American cities. But what is a shared problem is this issue of pensions and how much the pensions that politicians agree to play out in the future in a way that then essentially puts cities in just an impossible, and states, because Illinois as a state is having the same problem. It just, these promises can't be kept and they're putting local and state governments into the, the kind of vice. So I think what you saw this week in this bankruptcy judge's decision to not treat the pensions in Detroit as untouchable was this comeuppance for the unions, which have negotiated these pensions, right? I mean, this is part of how they agreed, they, their workers agreed to take lower pay was this promise about the future. And, and so I have sympathy for that. And I think, you know, when people bargain for something, they're supposed to get what they receive from collective bargaining, especially if it's a public employer. And yet this is totally untenable, the situation that a lot of cities and some states are in. So it sort of feels like something had to give, and that's what we're starting to see here. And so many other cities, I mean, I know in Chicago, Mayor Emanuel is basically... Stuck. Well, he's stuck. Yeah, no, he's definitely well, he's stuck. But he's been watching Detroit and just like... Because whichever way Detroit goes, he figures that's where he's headed. And and Chicago, which faces the same problems, the, the problem is that you kind of have to wait for the bankruptcy judge to rule to then be able to... I mean, this is the argument the unions are making, which is uh, and Rom can't make these cuts to pension these promises, can't unwind these promises without a judge stepping in. And the only way the judge would step in is if you were... Right, but, but he now has the this thing to hang over them, yeah. which is I can take the city into bankruptcy and we'll get we'd be able to cut pensions. Right, right. I so mean, make a deal before make a deal we now. do that and right. let the judge give us more powers than we, we have. So it's leverage. So what's interesting to me about Detroit is is this point that, that Joe Stiglitz, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist, made in an article that I that I read. I don't know if you guys looked at it, but that that you can say in some sense this is a the Detroit brought this on itself, you know, that it was mismanaged, that it borrowed money it shouldn't borrow, it it it, com it uh, committed itself to services it couldn't provide. Um, and that that there's some truth to that. But really what happened is it's a jurisdictional jurisdictional problem. Detroit, the Detroit metro area, the area around Detroit is not a poor area. It's a it still continues to be rich and prosperous. There there's there's still economic activity and vitality around there. University of Michigan is nearby, is an incredibly successful high-tech center there. There's still, the, the big three are still based around Detroit. Um, it's just that because the city itself is one jurisdiction and all these suburbs are another jurisdiction, these suburbs have their own, are incorporated on their own and, and have their own school system and their own fire departments, that 
that they are they don't get to be touched by this. So this isn't the case of a city which has died and taken in the, the entire metropolitan area with it. It's a metropolitan area that's basically okay with a which has chosen to in, in kind of escape from New York style concentrate all misery in one place and and allow it to and allow its its citizens to to suffer and die and and it it poses sort of a it's a political problem in a way which is how willing are the citizens of Michigan to be to to help out the citizens of Detroit this one part part of it well they don't have to now because the judge took the judges for them so how it shouldn't it be how willing are the people in the suburbs of Chicago willing to save Chicago right because because absent a judge forcing him to cut the pensions, uh, I think I mean, Chicago is not. I don't think inner ring Chicago. I don't think Chicago city proper is not anywhere near the shape that Detroit has been in. I mean, Detroit no, has lost two thirds of the population. The choices, I mean, all of its right, industry. Right. But Chicago it's, is still a very vital city. It's almost city. worse though because they're trying to. I mean, Chicago has to make the same cuts. He's already. I mean. He, no, he's already no started worse. making those cuts. They have a problem, but they're going to be able to solve it. Doesn't this feel to you guys like an old... I mean, I feel like growing up in Philadelphia, this was the constant drumbeat of fear right. in the city of Philadelphia, was that it was going to be emptied out, that everyone was going to move to the suburbs, no one would pay city taxes, and the whole thing would be this hulking, decayed shell. And instead, Philadelphia right. is in much better shape right. as a city right. than it was right. when I was growing up. It's true about Washington, too. This was like this huge problem that was supposed to play out in all these big cities that right. in fact has sort of only played out in Detroit. Right, and, and, Cle and Cleveland, and Cleveland. But Cleveland. I mean, but it doesn't mean that like Philadelphia would be... still has only 62% of its pension funded. So yes. like, when people retire, that's not going to be good. I mean, they're just right. the question. So the point is, it's doing well, but it's holding off. And the same with Chicago is like half of its pensions are funded. So the right, but... doomsday is coming. Well, what I think about that doomsday, though, is that it will be averted because the city is going to abrogate its promise about these pension plans. That's the writing that we're seeing on the wall, and that mayors like Rahm Emanuel are going to say, look, look at this bankruptcy ruling union. We have to renegotiate this, and that that's going to, it's going to be those workers who kind of pay the price for these cities being able to survive. Or you say, or, or another outcome is, we're at 62% now, uh, but this is a general, generally prosperous city, and in and as time passes, and as we when we really face our retirement crisis in 10, 20, 40 years, we will have raised that because the city itself is thriving. Detroit just has no possible way to thrive. Detroit just instead of economically growing, just borrowed money to 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 put this to avert this day for as long as possible. I don't think that's what that's not what Philadelphia is doing. That's not what Chicago is doing. That's not what Washington is doing. These cities I don't are think are thriving. And Chicago imagine there's a rosy future in which they meet these pension obligations as they exist now. Right. Well, but they're nor are they good, but they are not going to have to go into bankruptcy or anywhere near bankruptcy to deal well, with. They're going to threaten no. this, and then they're going to get the unions to renegotiate these deals because these deals are not going to be able to hold up. It's not going to be fair, but that's it seems like the obvious thing that happened now so, is the unions have even less leverage. Do you, what do you guys think, just as a, as a matter of pure justice, is it right to cut the negotiated pensions of employees who took this pension as a deal to, to in exchange for a lower salary or different working conditions? Is it more right to do that than it is to, you know, refuse to turn on the street lights and cut your police department to the bone and and do all the other things that Detroit could do in, 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 instead. And, and raise taxes to unsustainable levels. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, you make a promise to somebody who's worked for 30 years under that promise or however many years it's going to be, and they're at the end of their earning. Right, so you, you, I mean, I'm not sure how these deals actually get worked out. This may be the most dramatic characterization of it, but that seems to be... Uh, a pretty awful um, uh, outcome. Uh, uh, but what about the promise, to, the, the promise yeah. to your citizens, to your children, that you have can provide them a school system? Well, you've lived under one promise longer than the other, so uh, it feels that you're kind of more indebted to that promise. Maybe I don't know. Well, and you. That's interesting. I do not feel that way. You don't. That you think that it's ju more just. Contracts are. Can make a good justice-based argument. You can make a pragmatic argument that these pensions should be cut, absolutely, but justice, it seems like it is unjust. Well, but isn't it not, is it not unjust to, to, I mean, these are, these are, these are two bad options, right? These are two wrongs. Yeah, one wrong. Is, option, 
well, the second that's... option is is to say that the, that the citizens of the city uh, have certain basic rights. They have a right to public safety. Their children have a right to an education. I love this constitution you've created, which does not exist. No, <laughs> we don't have affirmative rights like that. No. What do you mean we don't have it? You, you certainly, I'm not talking about affirmative rights. I'm saying that as a moral question, do you not believe that children have a right to a decent education, that citizens have a right to public safety? I, I mean, certainly that's believe that. That's a nice that. idea, but there are lots of places where it doesn't exist and people can move. I'm not, I'm, I'm actually against this as a matter of pragmatism, but as a matter of justice, when you're not fulfilling your contractual obligation to people who, as John said, have worked for many years in anticipation of being able to have a decent retirement because of some, you know, vaguer, if very pressing, in terms of the future of your city, promise you've made to these other citizens, like, no. I mean, the problem is just that if the city empties out and dies, if you triple the tax rates, then that's not good for everyone. Well, but what does it, I mean, also, what does it mean to have a contractual obligation? I mean, I can, you know, you can, can, you make a, can you make a commitment to a contract that you cannot keep? They've signed it, but they are unable to keep, actually keep to the terms of this contract. Well, they're able to keep to the terms of the contract. They're just not able to keep to the terms of the contract and also have a thriving city. Yeah, exactly. They could take all the money that's left. I mean, you go in, D Detroit goes into bankruptcy. Every single dollar could go to the unions first, to the pension plans first, until this new ruling. That's what everyone ex assumed would happen, that the workers had a right to the unfunded part of their pension that trumped all the other creditors. And now, at least in, in the views of this one bankruptcy job in, judge in Detroit, that proves to not be the case. I do not. I guess I, I, I mean, I, I need to think about this further, but I guess I don't think that should be the case. I don't think that should be the case. I think there has, that's what, first of all, that's the point of bankruptcy. The point of bankruptcy is to, to stack rank these things. And it might be you stack rank it and you decide like, okay, this is a stronger claim than the claim of the people, the, the bankers who've loaned us money that they shouldn't get paid back first. But, but you know, what we it's... have for private companies is a regime in which the federal government insures to a degree pensions, but there are also all these requirements about how companies are not allowed to make these sweetheart promises without funding the pension. So they right. can't just waltz through decades in which they say, like, oh, yeah, it'll all be fine. Oh, whoops, now we can't pay the bill. And yet cities and states are not, they're not bound by that same set of rules. Is the guaranteed pension, this is the last question, is the guaranteed pension a good idea that we should all aspire to, or is the guaranteed pension something that's a that's a anomaly, a, a sort of a historical artifact, and we should be trying to get rid of it as fast as possible? Well, it is one one interesting set of solutions here is that um, you allow uh, those to whom promises have been made to stay whole, but that for existing workers who've operated under the promises for not 30 years but 10 that you say you know what you're not your pensions going away you're going to a 401k and you'll contribute more and um, so that you that you move more to a 401k uh, kind of model uh, that seems inevitable to me I'm not asking and, and, like what's happening no I'm no I know a, so that seems inevitable to justice. me and so uh, I think that's a well I don't think it's Is there you know, a downside to that John? Well, the downside is you get hooked into the market, and it's not a guaranteed benefit. It's a guaranteed contribution, so that your benefit could get chewed up by the market. Um, but I think that as a moral question, because you haven't made any, I guess you're you're unwinding a promise for some people maybe who've had it for a few years but not thirty. Uh, I don't know. I think moving to four hundred one k's is probably uh, you know not a horrible solution. I think that for government workers, there's always been this promise that they were taking lower pay, they weren't in maximizing their in earnings potential, right? They weren't in the private market, and yet at the end they were going to get this guarantee, and that was going to help make up for the less they'd gotten along the way. All right. We'll leave it there. Volo is signaling me. Volo, no, I'm not bored at all. I could talk about this forever. I'm, I, 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 ca I can't make up my mind whether I think, whether I want whether I want to crush all those people who have those guaranteed pensions or whether I want to be one of those people whether I'm whether this is a terrible thing or a great Lore thing my my here. my father has a guaranteed pension I always think like that's so great it's so lovely for him to have a guaranteed pension but but then it seems unsustainable anyway let's turn to cocktail chatter um, when you're in bankruptcy court Emily this weekend what are you going to be chattering about I watched this lovely video this week put together by a group called, I think, Number File, about how to win at Connect Four. You guys play that game with your kids? 
no, really. no, my kids play it. I don't play with no. them. Well, we play it a lot. And it turns out that there is like a formula for winning it if you play the perfect game. Um, and it starts with putting the first disc in the middle square at the bottom. And then there are all these other parts to it, obviously. But it was really interesting to see Connect Four broken down into this very large but not infinite set of different possible moves. And um, yeah, we can post a link. Cool. John, Connect, connect, connect. Five, baby. <laughs> So I was reading Scott Berg's book on uh, Woodrow Wilson, which is a, a great book. Who wasn't? Yeah, uh, which is a great book. And um, when uh, when Wilson was nominated, he was kind of like he was kind of indifferent yeah, to it. That's whether Churchill gets into the assembly. In a way, he was kind of indifferent to it, and he was losing the convention. Um, and Champ Clark was going to be the Democratic Party's nominee. And um, we could have had Basically, a president what named was, Champ. Yeah, it could have been, been a good. Champ. Uh, Champ. Anyway, Champ Clark was winning in the in the sort of backroom deals going on, and the Wilson uh, forces were frantic because all the the people working for Champ Clark were in the convention hall doing the buttonholing of the delegates and totally just winning in the old way the conventions used to run. They were winning the um, arm twisting battle, and they're literally they physically couldn't get the Wilson forces in. And so um, a young uh, first-term New York State senator named Franklin Delano Roosevelt re recognized I've heard that name before. That, um, that the Clark supporters had been able to get in to the hall because they were wearing these little buttons, these like like little stick pin buttons on their um, on their uh, their jackets. So Roosevelt, who knew the manufacturer of the buttons, went to the manufacturer, got him to print up hundreds more of these buttons, put all the Clark buttons on Wilson's forces, sent them into the, uh, got them, that allowed them to get into the hall where they could, you know, create an uproar and turn the tide for Wilson. That's uh, a great story. That was worth it. And then Churchill. <laughs> Champ Clark. Who, who was Champ Clark? He was, a, he was a congressman from Mississippi, I think. Or I've Alabama, never, heard, Mississippi. never heard of that guy. That's yeah. so great. President Clark. Okay. Uh, my chatter. First, a quick announcement. So uh, we auctioned off these t tickets to the escape room game that Emily, John, and I are going to be playing next Wednesday in San Francisco, and we asked you to put in bids for what you for a charitable donation that you'd make, um, and the highest bids we would give the tickets to. And I just I need to express how heartwarming this whole event was. So so I just want to announce our winners. So Kelly Yang and Jeff Bro. It hasn't even informed. happened. Kelly Yang and Jeff Bro uh, won the first pair of tickets by donating $2,025 to Action Against Hunger. Ron Huddleston won the second pair of tickets by donating $2,000 to the Tipping Point community, despite its poverty in San Francisco. There are two others to honor. We had a, a, um, a tie, actually, for the second pair. And Gil Potter lost the coin flip to Ron Huddleston. Uh, but Gil Potter is still donating $2,000 to the Wounded Warrior Project. So huzzah to you, Gil Potter. And then we had a late bid from Kunal Shah. After we'd already picked the winners, Kunal just misread when the deadline was. It was such a high bid that I was like, you know what, we'll, whatever. We'll have a meal with you, Kunal. <laughs> and so he's donating $7,001 to Reading Partners. Um, so it, all this sort of random idea, I don't even know whose idea it was, just to give away these extra tickets and, and raise money for charity, it generated more than $13,000 in charitable donations awesome. from you guys. And we were incredibly moved by this. So thank you to, to the, the four and also to all the other people who offer donations. It was, uh, you have big ears, big hearts. It was really very warming for us. Um, my quick chatter. So I watched my favorite movie I've seen in such a long time this week. Uh, Hannah and I watched a, an Israeli movie. Emily, I, if you haven't seen it, you will see it. Fill the Void. Oh, which I really is, liked that movie. Yeah, so it's about a Hasidic man who marries a woman. She dies in childbirth. The baby lives. He's a widower, and there's a younger sister to his his uh, his uh, just dead dead wife. And the question is, what will this younger sister, who's who's betrothed to somebody else, is she going and to she's marry? Not? Yeah, well, she's sort of betrothed. She wants to be. It's it's unclear. It's like it's it seems to be on Emily. Was Champ Clark anyway, involved? I don't think they were actually engaged. It's that would it's make it different. It's it different. seems it's it's okay. There's ambiguity there, but all right, fine. So this 18 year old girl has to decide what she's going to do. It is a beautiful movie. It's an intense movie. It's 
joyful. It's gut wrenching. Uh, I loved it. It's really short. It's beautifully lit. It's really warm. It's obviously this Hasidic community that is great to look at. Um, it's directed by Rama Burstein, who is the first ultra orthodox woman to make a feature film. Apparently, she's American born, lives in lives in Israel. It's uh, it's great. You so you liked it. I thought it was terrific. Absolutely yeah. recommend it. Can I just say that Champ Clark was from Missouri? Missouri. Yeah, yes, so we're so glad that you corrected that. Well, oh, yeah. Also, he was he was Speaker of the House. So All right. You, you should know that in your Speaker of the House bobblehead uh, collection, you should have remembered that. All right, the credits. So, and then I was like, you have to check out our show page, slate.com slash gabfest. It's like so totally awesome. And he was like, I am so going to email you at gabfest at slate.com. I'm totally going to check you out on Facebook at facebook.com slash gabfest. And then I was like, have you ever been on iTunes? I mean, all you have to do is like search for Slate Political Gabfest in the iTunes store and just leave a comment. And he was like, I'm not stupid. I totally follow him on Twitter at Slate Gabfest. And I was like, did you ever see that guy who's the producer, Mike, Mike Volo? He's like so hot. I'm totally going to intern for that guy. Just like that girl, Rebecca Cohen, who does it now. And Andy Bowers, he's like the boss of Slate Podcast. He's totally going to hire me. And he was like, John Dickerson and Emily Bazelon are so awesome, but what do you think about David Plotz? And I was like, I will so talk to you about that next week. <laughs> that, was, uh, that, was, that was really very well done. Thank you. Uh, and yet, and yet deeply one. disturbing. <laughs> deeply, well, it actually made me realize that David never says like. Also, I'm so glad you didn't ask me to do that because I'm worried people wouldn't actually see much variation from my normal tweets. That would be depressing. Uh, I have a good one for our live show next week. I thought I would, uh, then I, would, I just I saved it. All right, let's do the radio. And now, wait, do we need to? Uh... We're, we're still on with it. We, uh, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> This is GabFest Radio, a weekly program about politics and culture from Slate and WNYC. On this week's political GabFest, yet another unexpected new legal assault on Obamacare. Also, a high-profile campaign to raise the minimum wage. Also, does Detroit's bankruptcy herald disaster for all American cities? I'm David Plotz. Hello, and welcome to GabFest Radio from Slate and WNYC. I'm David Plotz in Washington. The Obama administration claims major improvements in healthcare.gov at the same time the state of Oklahoma is waging yet another legal battle to destroy the bill. Now, let me do that again. Uh, I'm David Plotz in Washington. The Obama administration claims major improvements in healthcare.gov at the same time the state of Oklahoma has launched yet another legal battle to destroy the Affordable Care Act. Will it succeed? Then fast food workers go on strike to wait. Then, fast food workers go on strike to raise the minimum wage. And then, a judge rules Detroit can gut the pensions of former city workers in order to recover from bankruptcy. It's one of America's formerly greatest cities finally bottomed out. And of course, we'll have cocktail chatter. Joining me in Washington is Slate's chief political correspondent, John Dickerson. Hello, John. Hello, David. And from New Haven, Slate senior editor, Emily Bazelon. Hi, Emily. Hey, David. Coming up, fast food workers go on strike to raise the minimum do that again. Coming up, fast food workers go on strike to raise the minimum wage. You're listening to GabFest Radio from Slate and WNYC. Coming up, can Detroit recover from bankruptcy by gutting employee pensions? You're listening to GabFest Radio from Slate and WNYC. This is GabFest Radio. I'm David Plotz along with Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, and this is the political GabFest portion of the show. Let's move on to our next topic. The bankruptcy judge in Detroit this week, blah, blah, blah. That'll do it for the political GabFest portion of the show. You'll find a longer version of the show with more topics at slate.com slash podcasts. I'm David Plotz in Washington. The Culture GabFest starts right now. Okay, thank you to everyone who's watching. You have uh, stumbled onto something new, which is a Slate experiment and a live stream of our regular taping of the political GabFest. It's something we might try more often in the future. If you have feedback about the live stream, you can leave feedback on the survey link on this page. And now, our intern, Rebecca, has selected three questions, which we're going to answer. We should actually do the radio stuff. We did the radio stuff. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, sorry, I lost my computer. Sweaty. Yeah. Was that a really long show, or just it didn't feel that long? It was 
it's longer than usual. Yeah. I guess that first topic was really two topics. Yeah. Okay. All right. We have questions. This one is from Jamie Mulvich. Uh. First one is from who? Jamie Mulligan. Jamie Mulligan has a question. Would it be good to tie the minimum wage to inflation, or would that actually keep it too low? Any thoughts? That's a hard question. It wouldn't. I mean, if they'd started that in 1968, it would you'd be okay. You'd have to yeah. tie to wa price, wage, in, price wage inflation, not price. Or would you I mean, tie it to price? Price is low. If you didn't hmm. start it, I guess at this point it's low. Well, I it's mean, low. it depends how, what they are relative to each other, right? Well, in any circumstance, if you set, yes, if you tied it to inflation right now, but then in three years, it would be, let's say, $8. It would still be low, but it would be but higher than it is now. If you went back to 1968 and tied it to inflation, it would be... Retroactively, it would be a, a good tightening thing to tie it to. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It seems like a. It, it would be a reasonable thing to pass a law which said the federal minimum wage goes up in the way that, co that Social Security, right, has right. traditionally been indexed that way. Right. But it's you such a fraud... to first hike it up somewhat and then do that. Right. I mean, it's just it's just a very fraught uh, thing. The minimum wage. The Republicans, Chamber of Commerce, really hates it, and so you have to battle for it every time. Then it becomes more like an entitlement. Uh, our next question: Brian Button asks, "Do you believe Elizabeth Warren when she says she won't run for president in 2016?" No. Not that I have any inside knowledge, but people are constantly. It's the one prerequisite for running for office is declaring that you won't run for office. So on that principle, I think... So if I say I'm running for office, then I'm not running for office? Right, exactly. I'm running for president in 2016. Yeah, see? There you go. You're not running. What, what do you think, Emily? Cult hero, and Elizabeth Warren is kind of a cult hero. There are going to be right. lots of people begging her to run pretty totally. much no matter what. Exactly. Uh, all right. All right. Maybe you are a cult hero, David. I am a cult hero. I'm apparently a cult hero to our third questioner, T. Coates, who asks, does David Plotz realize that a GabFest live stream is bound to bring up comparisons to the giant panda cam? I wonder how he feels about this. It's very similar to a giant panda cam in the sense that it's like people just sitting around doing nothing. People who are who have no are standing around. Where John and I are sitting, sitting around doing nothing uh, for hours at a time, wasting everyone else's time. So it is very much like the giant panda cam. I agree with that. Um, and. Uh, John is very cuddly, just like a giant panda. <laughs> David doesn't have very much fur on the top of his head, though. Um, I'm, I'm a bearded panda. You've moved, all, yes. all right. Thank you guys for watching this live stream and for tuning in. And uh, let's do it again sometime. And uh, Emily, we'll see you in we'll see you in a few days. San Francisco on the plane. San Francisco. We'll see me, in fact. On the yeah. plane from Washington. That's so great. All right. We're all on the same flight. We are. Have you guys picked your seats? No, can we sit together? John, you might not want to sit apart. John, John's like, can, can we sit apart? John, the left John is a good always look. likes to sit by himself. No, it's fine. We can sit together. I, don't, I doubt that there are going to be seats. Uh, <laughs> John, three open John, seats in the John plane like, without being John like, in the last has picked, row. John has fortunately picked his seat. Yeah. No, I picked Strangely, my seat today. there are two other people around me <laughs> already. No, I picked my seat today, but like, there, there aren't a lot. You guys get on it. That. I didn't even know that was possible. Well, you may already have your seats assigned to you, but what do you mean, how do we do that? Wave goodbye. Wave what do you not goodbye. travel? What do you, uh, you know?